your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 13. Uh, from time to time, I enjoy, I enjoy getting to have uh, communion, getting to have um, fellowship with uh, other pastors in the area. And a lot of times we'll talk about, you know, what are you preaching? What are you doing? And uh, a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation with a brother, and he said, what are you preaching through? I said, we're going to preach through Luke's gospel. And he said, how long is that going to take? And I said, I have no idea. A very long time. And he, he kind of challenged me. He said, you know, don't you think that maybe uh, it, it's it's maybe better to... Jump around a little bit, you know, uh, maybe give a couple weeks here, a couple weeks there. Luke, Old Testament, New Testament. I, said, I see there's value in that, but I also think there's a lot of value in just starting at the beginning and just plowing through. And so, friends, if anyone ever questions whether expository preaching is relevant, just consider our text today. Consider the events of this week and consider what we come to here in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Because the God in his providence, you know, has, I, I selected this text many months ago, but God in his providence has given it to us today as a word we need to hear from him. And surely all of his word is sufficient, all of it is authoritative, but uh, don't doubt the Spirit's work in our text today. So Luke 13, 1 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told him this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you for your word, that it is true today and every day. Lord, that its truths are timeless, given to us for our salvation, that we might know you, Lord, that we might trust you and believe in you, Lord, for our edification and for our growth. Lord, I pray these things would happen today in the preaching of your word. Lord, not by my power, but by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you empty me of myself and fill me with your spirits, Lord, that your words be heard today and not my own, that you receive all the glory. In the name of Christ, I pray these things. Amen. Where were you on Monday? Mine started pretty normally. I woke up, made my coffee, I prayed, I read my Bible, came here to the church, I went to a meeting, I came home to eat lunch, I called my brother, we were talking about all kinds of things, and he said, Did you hear about the events in Nashville today? I, you know, I don't ever really watch the news. I'm sometimes out of the loop. This was the first I had heard of the tragedy, but the rest of my day was spent scouring the internet, looking at all of the information I could, the numerous press releases about the tragedy that occurred, that occurred down at the Covenant School in Green Hills. And from then on, that Monday, it was not a normal Monday. I spent my time grieving, thinking, wondering, why could some, would something so terrible, so evil, so wicked happen in a place where there was so much potential for so much good? People trying to do things the right way. The Covenant School is a K-6 through private Christian school. It's affiliated with 
Covenant Presbyterian Church, who we just prayed for. It's a PCA church in Nashville. The pastor of that church preaches the same gospel we preach. He grew up in Hendersonville, graduated from Beach High School. He's our brother in Christ. Why this school? Why this church? Why these children? Why this tragedy? I sat and I read my Bible and I looked at the headlines. I wondered to myself, what would Jesus say in the midst of all this? What would Jesus say in response to the tragedy that we've experienced this week? Well, friends, as I mentioned earlier, in God's providence, our text today is timely because we are told exactly what Jesus says in response to tragedy. Jesus is asked these very kinds of questions in our text today. But you'll notice Jesus' answer is unique. It's not political in nature. It's not ideological in substance. Jesus does not give a list of things that people are to do in response to this tragedy. No, he really gives us a posture to assume, a way of life to embody. And this posture, this way of life, is repentance. The Christian life is to be a life of repentance from personal sin. Friends, whatever else you might feel in moments like these, whatever uncertainty, whatever questions you might have, and surely they are appropriate, we need to be reminded from God's Word, His revelation of Himself to us, that tragedy should lead Christians to fresh repentance of personal sins. It is so easy to talk about the evils of the world. So easy to talk about the fate of those who've done such terrible things, to speculate about all kinds of motives and things. It's so easy to talk about the evils out there, and it is so hard sometimes to identify the evils that are in here. And this is exactly what Jesus tells us to do in a moment like this. Repent. Or you will likewise perish. The great question that Jesus asks of you today is, have you repented? Have you trusted Christ? We must be reminded of what Jesus says in Luke 5, 32. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's the main idea of our text today, that Jesus has come to call sinners to repentance. And that's really the thrust of the response here. When Jesus responds to the crowds, he is hoping and desiring they will hear his words and respond in faith and repentance. That they will believe upon his name and trust in the Son of God. They will turn from their wicked ways and walk in the newness of life. Monday, in the aftermath of the tragedy, I got, to cha- I got the chance to watch a short little five-minute video Governor Lee put out responding to the tragedy. And by and large, I was thankful for what he said. Towards the end of the video, he began to quote phrases out of Scripture. He was encouraging Tennesseans and all those watching to pray for their enemies, reminding us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood encouraging us to love our neighbor. Friends, these are all good things. These are all scriptural things. These are all biblical ideas. And we should be thankful when we hear a charge like that, especially from an official like Governor Lee. We should be thankful when they say what scripture says. But all, uh, even though all those things are true, Jesus does not call for any of these things in response to a tragedy. You notice that? He calls for repentance. He takes it one step further. He makes it personal. You can watch the news all week. I'm sure many of you, like I said to someone, I've probably watched too much this week. Just how close the tragedy was, all of the factors that uh, that play into it. I've probably watched too much this week. You can listen to all kinds of interviews. You can read the articles. And no one will tell you what Jesus is telling you today. You're not going to hear a politician call you to repentance you're not going to hear some pundit uh, on, on the, the some, some police officer even to, to, to say, even though they're doing good and honorable work, they're not going to call you to repentance. But Jesus will, friends. And in repentance from sins, there is eternal life to be had. 
So what we have here today is not condemnation, but good news in the wake of a tragedy. But it is hard news. So don't miss the words of the Savior today. Notice first in our text, Jesus says this, those who do not repent will perish. Friends, that's a warning, but the warning also comes with a promise. Because if this statement is true, well, the opposite of it is true as well, as we'll see in just a moment. Jesus says those who do not repent will perish. Well, what about those who do repent? Well, they will not perish. Do you see how this is good news? Yeah, Jesus is speaking to those who have yet to repent. So we need to hear his warning appropriately. We see Jesus respond to two tragedies here in this text. And we have a two-fold admonition to repent. You notice that? There's two tragedies that are mentioned. One, there's an evil man who's responsible for it. And one just seems to be a freak accident. And yet Jesus' response is the exact same in both instances. Look at verse 1 with me. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. That's a strange verse. It's divorced from our context by a couple of millennia. We might be wondering, what in the world are they talking about? Well, apparently, this was breaking news. Apparently, this is something that had just happened recently in the life of the citizens of Galilee. And there were these Galileans who were worshiping at the temple, and Pilate had them executed in the middle of their worship. So the crowds really want Jesus' take on a political matter here. Pilate is a politician, and he has used his power to execute people of a specific ethnic group, executing these Jews who are worshiping. There's an ancient historian by the name of Josephus that... Uh, gave records around this time, and he tells us how wicked a ruler Pilate was. He lists at least four or five instances where Jewish people were attacked while worshiping, while doing construction work on the temple, on the holy city. He gives us a time where 6,000 Jews were murdered during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it doesn't seem like any of these particular instances are in view here in this text, but it tells us what kind of man Pilate is. He's wicked. He's evil. He hates God and he hates those who follow him. And apparently, this was a small number of Jews. And they were killed, apparently, offering sacrifices at Passover. And while the Jews are offering sacrifices as part of their worship of the Lord, Pilate executes them. So just, just imagine, if you, if you could, that you're there to do your supreme duty as a worshiper of the one true God, as a follower of Yahweh. You've come to bring your sacrifice. And the sacrifice was not cheap, friends. It was costly. And the blood is spilled out upon the altar as an expression that you need forgiveness from your sins. And in that moment, your life is taken from you. Your blood mixed with that same very blood offered upon the altar. It's a tragedy. It's wicked. It's vile. And the Jewish people hated it. They hated that it happened, and they hated Pilate for allowing it to occur, for commanding it to occur, rather. James Edwards, commentator on uh, the Gospel of Luke, he notes that Pilate's actions here express his disdain both for the Jewish people and for their worship of God. He treats the Jews like their sacrificial animals. So you can imagine the rage of the Jewish people. You can imagine the tension. They want to ask Jesus, this great teacher, this wise man, how should we respond to such persecution? Should they retaliate? Should they take up arms against Rome and against Pilate? Further, they're asking this question. Jesus, what did these poor Galileans do to deserve this kind of awful death? Blood was unclean to touch and to have your own blood mixed with the blood of uh, sacrifices. It, it, was, it was the most humiliating, dehumanizing kind of death. Do you note the similarities between our text and Monday? Pilate killed the Jews because they were Jewish, because they were practicing their religion. 
a criminal on Monday attacked a school because it was a Christian school. Because that individual hated what was being taught there. Pilate hated that the Jews offered sacrifices in service to God, so he slew them. And the criminal on Monday hated that these Christians were offering themselves as living sacrifices to the Lord. So, that individual did what they did. How does Jesus respond to this tragedy? Verse number two. He answered them, Do you think that these Galileans are worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Baked into this question is the assumption that these Galileans who died in this terrible way, experienced this terrible fate, they must have been extraordinary sinners. They must have been really bad to have suffered in this particular kind of way. And subtly in this question, this crowd is asking Jesus, Jesus, is, is the same kind of thing going to happen to me? Because of my ethnicity, because of my religious practice. I think the word all in this text is really important. You see it there in verse number two. He, said, he says, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? You notice Jesus' response in verse 3. No, but I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, the, the crowds want to ask questions about some people, but Jesus wants to talk about all people. That's an important thing for us to understand. These are timeless truths that Jesus tells us. The crowd thinks that they are not in any immediate danger, but Jesus tells them, in fact, that they are. If they do not repent, that they will perish just like the Galileans perished. Jesus clearly tells the crowds here that the reason that these Galileans died while sacrificing, while worshiping, was not because they were worse sinners than all the rest of the people in Galilee. That's very clear in the text. We cannot assume that because evil or, a, or disaster befalls someone, that that evil or that disaster is necessarily because of their sin. Now it's clear in the Bible sometimes the Lord sends a plague because of the sinfulness of some people, but that's not always the case, Jesus tells us here. And so Jesus turns the question onto the crowds, and that if you, unless you repent, you will also perish. So the crowd asked Jesus this question. Jesus, what happened to them? Jesus turns that on his head and says, what will happen to you? You're so concerned about them. Are you concerned about your own soul? The call here is a call to repent of sin. The crowds are asking if the Galilean sin was so bad as to earn them some kind of tragic death. But Jesus does not really address the sin of those who died, but the sins of those who could hear his voice. And he says, if you do not repent, do not repent, you will likewise perish. Friends, when tragedy occurs, you should repent. J.C. Ross says this. He says, let us feel tender pity and compassion for all who suffer violence or are removed by sudden death. But let us never forget to look at home. And to learn wisdom for ourselves from all that happens to others. How easy would it have been for Jesus to convince the crowds of how evil Pontius Pilate was? How easy would it have been for Jesus to cause the crowds to pity even more those who were slain while worshiping? This is truly a tragedy. But Jesus tells us about a greater tragedy in this text. It's a greater tragedy to live your life without repenting. A long life with no repentance is worse than a short life filled with repentance. The question is, do we really believe that? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to live like it's true. Jesus is saying to the crowds, who I think we're understanding are not yet followers of Jesus, he's saying, don't you see you still have time to repent? Don't you see that today is given to you that you might repent and follow the Lord? The time for them to repent is over, but the time for you to repent is today. Jesus tells the crowd their only hope is to repent and follow after him. 
For if they do not, a greater tragedy will befall them. Friends, it's much easier to watch the news than it is to repent. It's much easier to talk about the Second Amendment than it is to repent. It's much easier to blame the evils of transgenderism than it is to repent. But Christians, primarily, are not those who blame other people for their sins. They are those who repent of their sins. The crowd, the crowds wanted Jesus to denounce Pilate for being a wicked ruler. And let's be clear, Pilate was a wicked ruler. You know, saying that we need to repent of our sins doesn't mean that we just cast a blind eye to all those other things. But this rises to the surface. This is the most important thing. Because, you know, if Jesus would have denounced Pilate as a wicked ruler, what that would have done was simply cause the crowds to deflect from the sin in their own hearts. At least I'm not like Pilate. At least I'm not as bad as he is. I can't be as wicked as this evil person. Friends, that's not the way Christians evaluate the state of their hearts. I don't compare myself to other people, to other sinners. I repent because I've fallen short of God's righteousness. I'll speak more plainly about repentance in a moment just, just to show you that tragedy is an invitation to repent of personal sin. Sin that the Holy Spirit convicts you of in your hearts. It is a call to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. And we have not one example, but two examples in this text. Look at verse 4. Jesus gives another example. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Apparently there was a region of, Jeru of the city of Jerusalem called Siloam. And for whatever reason, there was a, a, there was a scaffolding that was being used to work on a tower. And either the scaffolding fell over and killed 18 people or the tower itself fell over and killed 18 people. We're not exactly sure. But this doesn't appear to be um, some kind of persecution by a, a religious official or by someone like Pilate. This just appears to be an accident, uh, an act of God, so to speak. You'll notice Jesus' response is exactly the same. When we experience the effects of living in a fallen world, what are we to do? We are to repent of our sins. Again, notice the alls in this text. In verse 4, Jesus asks the question, Do you think these were worse sinners than all of Jerusalem? And then in verse 5, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus does not want us to understand our depravity in relation to other people. We are not to recognize that our sins are less heinous than other people's sins. Jesus is not here trying to make the point that those who are worse sinners get worse judgment in this life. No, he's trying to help the crowd in front of him to see that the tragedies that occurred in this text are not because of the uniqueness of these sinners. Jesus does not tell us why these tragedies happen, but he clearly tells us that everyone involved in this tragedy is a sinner. We're not to look down on those on whom tragedy has fallen and say, wow, what poor sinners. They must have done something really bad to have earned that kind of fate. This is the kind of thing Jesus tells us to avoid. Rather, when we see tragedy, our response should not be sizing up other people's sins, but to search our own hearts, to run back to our Creator, our Maker, our Savior, fall at His feet. And confess our desire to walk with him in obedience. And in this way, all sorts of tragedies should lead us to repentance. Fresh repentance. You see the plain, the plain con condition in this text. Jesus says, if, if you do not repent, then you will perish. Jesus uses a physical tragedy to draw attention to a spiritual reality. We see two tragedies that result in physical death. The first one is tragedy at human hands. The second one is a tragedy of a natural sort. So the first tragedy, Pilate uh, kills these Galileans while they're worshiping God. Friends, the parallels between Pilate's execution of the Jews and the tragedies on Monday could not be more clear in the text. I don't need to elaborate on them. It's clear an evil person did a wicked thing 
towards those who were attempting to do something God had told them to do. There are few things more honoring to the Lord than attempting to give a child a Christian education. Yet, how would Jesus have us personally respond to a tragedy like that? Before we say anything else, the first thing we need to do is repent. That's the first thing all Christians should do. Repent of your own sin. If you're struggling to find sin in your heart today, oh friend, keep looking. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment because it is there. You must repent of your sin if you were to follow Christ. Repent or you will perish. But notice the second tragedy. It's an act of God. No one necessarily did anything to make the tower fall. This week I was considering the the poor folks in Mississippi we prayed for last week who suffered the natural disaster. A tornado ripped through the town of Rolling Fork and killed 25 people. Many more lost their homes. I was thinking about this Friday night as I was sitting in front of my TV watching the weather and on my phone wondering what, what might happen in these moments. Should I go to bed or should I stay up? I, at the bottom of the TV on the Weather Channel, I was, I was struck by this. It said there were 17 million people under a tornado watch on Friday night. Just think about that. 17 million people's lives just hanging in the balance. Friends, what are we to do? We are to repent. If we do not repent, we will perish. We will face some kind of fate much worse than a tornado much worse than an unjust crime. We are to repent. These disasters are not things that are far from us. They are very near to us. And yet, whether the evil occurs by a wicked sinner or by a natural disaster, Jesus' response is exactly the same. Repent or you will perish. So you might be asking the question, what is repentance? We must understand the scripture tells us that Repentance is not some work that we do to earn God's favor. Rather, it is a result of believing. It's a work of the Holy Spirit of God's grace in us. In Scripture, repentance and belief go together. That is, you cannot repent of your sins without believing Jesus is the Christ and died for your sins. The Baptist Catechism, a 17th century document, says it this way. Question 94 of the Baptist Catechism says, What is repentance unto life? The answer, Repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin, an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does, with grief and hatred of sin, turn from it unto God, with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. You know, it, in a, after a crime, after a tragedy, it's really easy to say that we hate sin. But friend, do you hate your sin? Not just the effects of your sin. Do you hate the very act of your sin? Do you hate it like God hates it? Or do we coddle it? Do we say it's not that big of a deal? Jesus says, repent, or you will perish. Repentance is the work of the Spirit whereby we are brought to see our sin as it truly is and turn from that sin and follow Jesus Christ. The reason Jesus told the crowds to repent is because repentance is the first act of following Jesus. When Martin Luther penned his 95 Theses at the start of the Reformation in 1517, the first of his 95 Theses reads like this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be repentance. The reason Jesus says that if we do not repent, we will perish is because if we do not repent, we are not Christians. That's not because we earn God's favor by our repentance. But this is the fruit that is naturally born in the life of those who are regenerated, of those who belong to the Lord. So I must ask, in the wake of this tragedy, in the hardship of the moment, have you heard the Savior's voice? Have you repented of your sins? And are you repenting of your sins? Is this a part of your lifestyle? Do you mourn your sin as much as you mourn the effects of living in a fallen world? Friends, these aren't questions I can answer for you. These are conditions or attitudes of your own heart. But search your heart today. 
Have you come to the Savior by grace through faith, placing your wholehearted trust upon Jesus Christ and on his saving work on the cross of Calvary? Do you believe that when Jesus died upon the cross, he didn't just die for sins, but he died for your sins, for the wicked things you have done, and that he is the only one who can save you? Are you, are you placing your hope in his resurrection today, in eternal life? Friends, Jesus does not mince words here. Repent or you will perish. But the glorious news of the gospel is that if you do repent, if you can answer those questions affirmatively and say, yes, I have repented. Yes, I have trusted in Jesus. Then can I just tell you what's true for you today, this moment, whatever might happen in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead? John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes is, in, in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Tragedies cause us to ask hard questions. Why did God allow this? If God is just, what are we to think of those poor parents grieving today? If God is so good, why is there such evil in the world? Friends, these are all good questions to ask and questions that we should ask. But there is a question that is much more, or just as important, but much more, much more urgent. It comes before all of those questions. And that question is, is Jesus Christ your Savior? Before you can begin to ask questions about how a good God could allow such terrible things, you must first enter this question. Do you know Jesus? Have you trusted Him? This is so much more important, so much more urgent than those other questions. Because only belief in Jesus will rescue us from perishing. And so Jesus tells us a parable in this text about the urgency of our repentance. Notice secondly, and more briefly this morning, that those who repent must do so while there is still time. Jesus tells a, a parable here about time. Look at verse 6. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, For three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? So this parable Jesus is telling is not really illustrating the point, but the urgency of the point that he's just made. I hope that makes sense. So this, this parable is tied directly to that teaching about repentance, but it's expressing the urgency of repentance for the sinner. Here we have a, a fig tree planted in three years normally, a fig tree should have yielded its fruit. But this fig tree does not. And if a fig tree won't yield figs, what's it good for? It's good to be dug up and cut up and burned. And the text says, as if it remains as it is, using up the ground, it's preventing the owner of the vineyard from doing anything else with that land. And we should notice in the text that the, the, the fig tree was not planted in the desert. It was not planted on rocky soil. It was not planted in a place that was inhospitable to agricultural life. It was planted in a vineyard. It was planted in fertile ground that if things continue the, the natural course, the way nature works, this tree should be growing because everything else in the vineyard is growing except for this tree. The fact that this tree had not grown or not borne fruit in three years meant it was probably never going to bear fruit. Now I mentioned a few weeks ago about how poor my agricultural skills are. I mentioned uh, how you know just inadequate I am at simple tasks like gardening. Uh, last last year, this the the garden Jessica and I tried to plant was the prime evidence of how in, how inadequate I am, how how much help I need. Um, we spent a weekend tilling and planting, watering, planting for a vegetable garden. And I wouldn't say it was a total failure. We had some success, but in the, in the, we were at Lowe's picking out plants. And Jessica comes up to me with these blackberry bushes. And I thought, I like blackberry cobbler, so this seems like a good idea. I didn't, I didn't know it takes like years 
before you actually get blackberries. That's the first problem. Second, I got this package from Lowe's. That might have been my, 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 uh, my main issue. But on the package, it said guaranteed to grow. I, I, just, I just wonder who I'm supposed to call today. But maybe they're watching the sermon. I don't know who I'm supposed to call. But these bad boys did not grow. I followed the instructions to a T. I dug my hole. I put my water. Uh, the garden... Uh, after about a couple weeks, it was teeming with life. You know, little bitty tomatoes growing, little peppers here and there, the zucchini plants looking great. I had some little baby watermelons, and then I had this other corner of the garden with my blackberry bushes. And it looks like someone had taken a stick out of the yard, and jammed it in a hole, and covered it with dirt. It looks like something my dogs had done for fun in the free time they have. <laughs> Somebody... <laughs> Carl Johnson told me that blackberry, blackberry, sorry, Carl, uh, blackberry bushes take a little while to grow, and so here I am, like a dummy, watering this stick that's coming up out of the yard for like a month. Oh, it's just got time. It's just got to take time. After a while, Jessica said, "You know, that's not going to grow, right? You know, it's just, it's dead. It's, if we we missed it. We'll not go. To, we'll not buy those at Lowe's next year. Whatever. We're done, right? That's not gonna. So I went out there and I plucked it up. I dug it up and I got rid of it. And that was right for me to do because it was taking up room in my garden. Now, with that particular example, there was probably user error at many points along the way. I, you know, I, I, I give you that. But the point is, if there's no life on the plant, there's no fruit on the vine, then the owner of the garden gets to do whatever he sees fit. With that plant. It's his vineyard. It's his garden. Friends, the church is the Lord's vineyard. And we are all trees in the Lord's vineyard. And scripture regularly uses this kind of imagery to talk about Christians. So, with that being said, what are we to make of what happens in the text? Look at verse 8. We see a worker intercede on behalf of the tree. Verse 8. Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The worker, I don't know why he has such compassion for this lifeless tree, but he does. And he comes up and he says, don't cut it down yet. Maybe he's the one that spent all the time planting and cultivating. He just wants to give it a little bit more time to see that his work might come to fruition. He comes and he intercedes, says, just give me a little more time. Let me put some fertilizer around it. Maybe next year it'll bear fruit. But then, sure, cut it down. And the owner of the vineyard hears the request of the worker. What are we to make of this parable? We're to understand that God is giving a little bit more time today. He is giving a little bit longer for you and for others to repent. The parable is simply pointing to God's graciousness, that he's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The fact that God has not destroyed the world again, like he did in the days of Noah, is not a testament to our improvement as a society. It is a testament to his grace and his mercy and his patience towards sinners. The hope of the worker here is that the manure spread around the base of the tree will provoke the tree to to grow. It's a last-ditch effort to save this tree from being cut down. I ask the question today, how many people are just like this fig tree? How many people are claiming to be members of God's church yet have no fruit to point to in their lives, no fruit they can show for it? Perhaps today, Perhaps even this moment, the Lord is fertilizing you. He's spreading manure around the tree trunk of your life in hopes that you will grow, that you will bear fruit. Christian, what kind of fruit can you point to in your life and say, this is the kind of fruit that I am bearing in God's vineyard? Is there any? Can you point to an evidence of God's grace in your life? And I praise God when I look around this room week by week, I can point to a fertile vineyard. I see so much evidence of God's spirit at work in so many of you and in your life. And it's just encouraging to me. Many of you just need to take heart and look at the the work of the spirit in your own life and praise God for his grace towards you. But maybe some of you, maybe there's no fruit you can point to in your life. This is the Lord's vineyard. 
He can do whatever he pleases with his vineyard. And it has pleased God today to allow me to preach at least one more sermon and allow you to hear at least one more sermon, to hear the scriptures, to sing these songs, to know these people. How many more means of grace does God have to give before you will follow him fully? Just as the owner of the vineyard was gracious to allow one more year before cutting down that tree that would not bear fruit, the Lord Jesus is gracious today in allowing sinners at least one more day, at least one more hour to repent of sin. The slowness of God to judge sinners is not because he is powerless, but because he is patient. Consider what Paul says in Romans 2, 3 through 5. He says, Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Friends, God's patience is meant to lead us to repentance. We're all called to repent today. What do you do in the wake of tragedy? Well, we should pray. We should pray for those who are, have been harmed, those who have harmed us. We grieve with those who are grieving. And yet we know, as those who know that death is not the end of the story, that there is a day coming where the Lord Jesus will set everything right. He will undo all the evil that has been done. So we should repent. We should call others to repent, knowing that repentance and belief is the natural response of someone who has who is following Christ. Just like fig trees produce figs, Christians produce repentance. And friends, let me just assure you, if you're unsettled, if you have questions, that the gospel gives us more hope than any other news in all of creation. You may have heard the pastor of, of Covenant Presbyterian Church. You, you may have heard that he was one of the parents who lost a little one this week. And he was asked in response to the tragedy what, what he was feeling. And he said this. He said, through tears, we trust that she is in the arms of Jesus who will raise her to life once again. And we await that day when Jesus will come again. That our hope today is in the resurrection of Christ. That he came once to save us will come again to take us home. And Jesus tells us at the end of Revelation 22, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.